Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, Dr. Paul Fromer is a professor emeritus at USC, best known for developing the Navi Conlang in the best-selling James Cameron movie, Avatar. Uh, Dr. Fromer has since been uniquely involved in expanding the language, which has taken on a life and a community of its own. Uh, on behalf of the Harvard Undergraduate Linguistic Society and the Harvard Radcliffe Science Fiction Association, um, thank you so much for being here today, um, Dr. Sure. Fromer. Uh, Adam, thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Let me uh, let me begin by greeting you properly in Navi. Um, so what I just said was, hello everyone, I see you, that's the iconic I see you from Avatar. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you um, to discuss the Navi language. I must say I've given a number of talks, but I've been particularly looking forward to this one. Uh, for one thing, it's great to be with other language enthusiasts uh, where I don't necessarily have to go into a lot of detail explaining what phonetics and phonology and morphology and syntax are. Um, I also wanted to thank you for um, uh, channeling your questions through Adam to me. That gave me um, a good sense of the kinds of things that you might be interested in. Um, I think I'll probably be able to answer most of them in the course of the actual presentation. But just in case uh, there are some questions that I've missed, uh, we can hopefully get to them in the Q&A. So what I was planning to do is um, first talk a little bit about my background, about how I, I got where I am in my career right now, and then go into the actual PowerPoint presentation. That I hope will take maybe about 50 or 55 minutes. And then we should have a fair amount of time for Q&A. So I hope that's OK. Uh, so how did, I, uh, how did I get the job? Well, let me uh, fill you in a little bit on, on my background. I did my undergraduate work in Rochester, Rochester, New York, at the University of Rochester. And it might surprise you to learn that not only was I not a linguistics major, but I never had a linguistics course as an undergraduate. I was an astrophysics major. Now we're talking ancient history here. This was the early 60s. And I was convinced as were my parents and all my friends that I was gonna be an astronomer. So I started out as an astrophysics major at the U of R, um, switched to math in my senior year. So I actually uh, graduated with a degree in mathematics. That was in 1965 had no idea what I was going to do, but I made one of the best decisions in my life, which was to join the US Peace Corps. So I got an assignment um, in Malaysia to teach secondary school uh, mathematics and some ESL. And that was a very significant experience for me because it was the first time that I realized that maybe what I really was interested in more than anything was language and languages. Now, up to that point, I had had a fair amount of experience with languages, maybe more so than most people. Uh, my first non-English language was Yiddish because my parents were Yiddish speakers in New York. Uh, their primary language was English, but they were both fluent Yiddish speakers and they used a the language between them, unfortunately, only when they didn't want my brother and me to understand. So although I was exposed to a lot of it, I didn't necessarily uh, become a, a speaker myself. The next language I was exposed to was Hebrew because as a Jewish kid in New York, you're sent to Hebrew school. In the seventh grade in junior high school, I began studying Latin. Believe it or not, in public schools in New York at that time, I'm not sure they still do. They actually had Latin as an option and I wound up having Latin for four years. It was a great experience. I also had some French in high school uh, when I went to college, I continued with French, had a little German, tried to study some Arabic on my own. 
And then I got the assignment for the Peace Corps in Malaysia. We had had three months of Peace Corps training uh, in Hawaii. And during that time, they had native speakers come over and we had maybe, I don't know, two or three hours of language learning for about three months. You can't get terribly far uh, with that arrangement, but I did fairly well. And it turns out that I was one of the very few volunteers who were assigned to a Malay medium school. That is a school where they're using the Malay language the time it was called Bahasa Kabangsaan, national language, using it as a media of instruction. And so I wound up uh, with very little preparation uh, teaching geometry and algebra in Malay, which was, as you could imagine, quite a bit of a challenge. But the funny thing is that at the end of two years, I felt I could probably do as good a job in Malay as I could in English. So that gave me a sense that maybe whatever talent I had might lie in the area of language. So back in the States, when I decided to go to graduate school, I did it in linguistics. Okay. Uh, and so I began my grad work in, 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 at USC in linguistics. During that time, I had the opportunity to spend a year in Iran that was in the middle of the 70s before the revolution, amazing experience, during which time I plunged into the study of Persian. When I got back to the States, I switched my dissertation topic, threw away everything I'd done before, began a new topic uh, in colloquial Persian syntax that after worked out and I got my, uh, my PhD. At that point, I decided, hmm, maybe I should go into business. And so I, after some floundering around, I wound up at a Los Angeles corporation and was in the business world for 10 years. So that took me to 1995. And then I had another change and I wound up back at USC teaching, but not in the linguistics department, rather, believe it or not, in the business school. And I, um, I convinced the chair of the business communication department that I knew something about the subject. Of course, I figured, well, linguistics sure sounds like communication and had 10 years in business, so put them together, business communication. And so I was there at USC teaching for about 16 years. And eventually I became chair of the department myself. Okay, so that brings us up to 2005. 2005, something very significant happened. Um, I have to introduce you to this gentleman here. Let me go back here. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, let me do this instead. Um, this is kind of what I thought would be our agenda for today. So I'm gonna kind of go through um, these topics in turn. So I'll talk about how I got the job, give you a little whirlwind tour of Navi. That'll be the nitty gritty part of it with uh, information about the grammar and so on. Um, how I worked with the actors, what happened after the movie was out, which is I think quite interesting. And then my relationship with the Lit Fiaolo, which is the language community. Okay, so how I got the job. So I have to introduce you to this fellow here who is Professor Ed Finnegan. It was my very first linguistics professor at USC. He since became my colleague, my mentor, and also close personal friend. So in the summer of 19, I'm sorry, in the summer of 2005, I get an email from Ed Finnegan uh, forwarded to me. Now he at the time was in the linguistics department. I was not, I was in the business school. Turns out that James Cameron's production company had sent uh, an email to various linguistics departments in Southern California. 
asking for a linguist who might be able to develop a language for a science fiction film. At the time, we didn't know the word or the term avatar. It was uh, Project 880 was a code name. So Ed gets the email, looks at it and says, I think, I think this sounds like Paul. So he sent it to me. I would never have seen it if he hadn't. And I said to myself, oh yeah, this is something that I really want. And so I essentially applied for the job. I wrote James Cameron a very enthusiastic letter. I also sent him a copy of our book. So um, Ed and I put together this linguistics workbook to go along with his textbook, introductory textbook. It's called Looking at Languages. Um, I'm sure that you've had things like, like this in your own courses. It's essentially a problem book. Uh, it has data in about 30 different languages for students to kind of sink into, get their hands, get their hands on, kind of practice the theoretical concepts, concepts they've been um, exposed to. Uh, one of the problems in the book was one I put together on Klingon, because I had learned just enough Klingon to be able to put together uh, a problem for students. So I emphasize that, and I think maybe um, Jim Cameron was impressed. Anyway, I get, I get this call a week or so later, why don't you come in and talk to Jim? And that was a truly magical afternoon. I spent an hour and a half uh, in his private office in Santa Monica, Los Angeles. And I got to know this guy and it worked out pretty well. We kind of hit it off. And at the end of the hour and a half, he stood up, he said, welcome aboard. And my life really hasn't been in the same sense. So uh, how do you put together a language? Well, there are certain constraints that I was working under. And some of them were externally imposed and some were self-imposed. It's a very different thing if you're doing a language totally for yourself, for your own purposes. But this was done at the behest of someone else. So obviously I had to find out what Jim Cameron had in mind, what he was hoping the language to be. So the externally imposed constraints of course came from him and came from the situation. First of all, it had to be an entirely new language, something that no one had ever heard before. He wanted it to sound nice. Now, the beauty of the language obviously is in the ears of the beholder. What might sound nice to one person might not sound so nice to another. So that's a very subjective thing. But uh, I must say, uh, with the choices I've made, I have gotten some nice feedback. People seem to think that that it's a it's a nice sounding language. No electronic manipulation of the voices. This was important. The actors were going to have to speak the language uh, using their own voices, no manipulation. And so obviously it had to be something that human beings could produce. And this was in line with the the situation, the constraints of the story, because the assumption was that the Navi themselves, although uh, they're very big and very blue and they have tails, their vocal production mechanism was virtually the same as ours. And so that meant that I would use very human sounds in the language. I didn't start from absolute scratch because Cameron had come up with a few words of his own. I would say that these are maybe approximately 30 words. They were generally names of characters, names of places, sometimes names of animals. So I took a look at those and realized that whatever phonology I came up with, whatever finesse and phonology had to incorporate what he had come up with. Doesn't mean it had to be Sorry, had to be limited to that, but I had to certainly include it. Now, this was important. Even though it's an alien language, this language, according to the script, was learnable by humans because humans had learned to speak it. So, of course, that 
that says something to a language constructor about what kind of language it could be. We could all come up with grammatical rules, which were kind of off the wall, which a computer might be able to handle, but no human being would be able to handle in a natural way. You know, something happens after the fourth word of a sentence. Okay, there are no languages like that. So I knew that whatever it was had to be stuff that, that was compatible with human lear learning capacity capabilities and probably had to be compatible with um, universal grammar. And finally, I don't know why that okay. had to be feasible for the actors, okay? Um, the actors, of course, were, were tasked with learning to say this stuff and pronounce it accurately and give it a correct intonation and inflection, make it sound like their own language while they were acting. And so I knew that, uh, that it, it, it had to be reasonable in that sense. Okay, so those were the, what I call the externally imposed constraints. There were internal constraints as well that I imposed myself. So for one thing, I wanted it to stand up to scrutiny. I had a very good idea that Avatar was gonna be a big deal and that there would be a, a certain subset of the audience, not a very large subset, but a very intense subset and a vocal subset who would be looking at the language with a microscope. And so I wanted to make sure that whatever I did really passed scrutiny and was linguistically viable. I wanted to make it interesting for anyone who wanted to delve into it, right? Uh, I wanted to make it unusual, even though it had to be a very human-like language, I wanted to go in directions um, that were a little bit unexpected and un un unpredictable, perhaps. And this last one was something that I was keenly aware of. I call it balancing complexity with accessibility, which is to say, you can sort of go off the deep end in two different directions here. You can make the language extremely simple, extremely understandable, so that the barriers to entry are very low, barriers to admission, so to speak. But that also might make for a rather uninteresting language. The opposite extreme is to make it so complex that anyone who wanted to learn it would throw up their hands and say, Forget it, I'm never gonna, gonna master this. So I try to come down somewhere in the middle and I'm kind of pleased with the way it worked out because um, I think Navi does make a, uh, does do a good job of balancing complexity with accessibility. Okay, uh, so I knew of course that what I would have to do is address these various aspects of language, which you're very familiar with, phonetics and phonology, morphology, syntax. And maybe the, the most fun part was the interplay between language, culture, environment, and the people who speak the language. Because to one extent or another, every language is reflective of the people who speak it and where it's spoken and so on. The extent of that relationship is not absolutely obvious, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so um, that being said, let's actually take a look at aspects of the language itself. So here's a little whirlwind tour, beginning with phonetics and phonology. So this is the consonant system, 20 consonants. Uh, before anything else, if you take a look at the chart, you realize immediately this is not IPA. Okay, so this is simply the spelling system that I came up with for the language. It's, it's pretty transparent. Uh, the thing that would probably strike you more than anything is this line here, which are the ejectives. Um, just to tell you how they sound. Um, this one, the bilabial one is, uh, so we have word, things like ah, e. This one is uh, so 
o. This one is ka, so it's ka. Um, ejectives are not made with a pulmonic airstream mechanism from your lungs, but rather with the glottalic. So it comes from your glottis. Uh, these are real speech sounds in real human languages. Um, they're found, for example, in Amharic in Ethiopia. Uh, they're found in Georgian. Lots of weird things are found in Georgian. They're found in lots of Native American languages. And I thought it'd be kind of fun to include them. The X is simply an orthographic device, it has no meaning of its own. I was thinking, how do I write this? And it just turned out to be a fairly good way to do it. Uh, the apostrophe is a glottal stop. And as you all know, it's found, it's found marginally in English. When we say, uh-oh, there's actually a consonant in the middle there, and that's a glottal stop. And also I indicated it with an apostrophe. I wanted to make very sure that people understood that the apostrophe is not just there for decoration. And a lot of uh, what I might call naive constructed languages, people seem to throw in uh, apostrophes all over the place as sort of decoration or seasoning. I wanted to make sure that it had a meaning. And so the name of the language is spelled N-A apostrophe V-I. You, you pronounce that apostrophe. It's not Navi, it's Navi, Navi. And uh, to a greater or lesser extent, people seem to, seem to be uh, okay with that. One thing you notice about this chart is what's not there. And so probably it immediately uh, pops out to you. There are no voiced stops. There's no buh, de guh. And there are, other, uh, there are other familiar sounds from Western languages that are, there's no ch, there's no, you know, you don't have that affricate. Uh, there's no sh, uh, probably some other things as well. So, uh, one of the reasons that I came up with this sound system is that in Cameron's original words, I thought that there might be a bit of a Polynesian influence. In fact, he had just come back from New Zealand and I thought maybe he had some Maori in, in, his, uh, in his head. And one of the characteristics of Polynesian languages is that they don't have voice stops. So, you know, that's some of the reasoning that went into this. Seems like uh, it, it has worked out to be a pretty good mix Okay, here's a vowel system. Seven vowels, well, phonemes. Um, and again, this is my own transcription. It's not IPA. Uh, this is E, E, so this is tense and lax. U, E, actually this is lax. O, this is A, the uh, low front vowel, and this is A, the low back vowel. So you notice it's somewhat asymmetrical. That's just the way it is. So we have a, a tense lax distinction among the high front vowels, but not among the high back vowels. In addition to the vowels, there are these things called pseudo vowels. So the two liquids, L and R, uh, can function as vowel like elements, like center of syllables by themselves. So you can have a word like K L L, K, there's no vowel there. Which means ground and word like T R R, trr, which means day. And, and then there are diphthongs. And the diphthong set in Navi is really nice and symmetrical. Three of these are very familiar to you. One might not be. So this is al, I, a. This is the one that's a little weird, is eu, eu, but it's just as prominent in Navi as the others. I'm not sure why most languages that we come across don't seem to have this one. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna call the, the um, inventory of phonemes. But of course, that's not all there is to phonology, right? We have these things called phonotactic constraints, which are the rules that tell you what's permissible in terms of interaction between phonemes in terms of position and so on. Uh, okay, so in terms of positioning, you don't have free choices because only 
certain consonants can be syllable final. Only the red ones can come at the end of a syllable. And that's a very strict rule. So for example, uh, sorry, a syllable in Navi cannot end in S. That doesn't happen. It can end in NG, but also the velar nasal can be syllable and word initial. This, by the way, was probably the thing that the actors had the most difficulty with. It was kind of um, unexpected. I would have thought that they would have a hard time with the, with the adjectives. Turns out that people learn to master that pretty well. But to put the velar nasal at the beginning of a word, that was a very unnatural thing and quite difficult for a lot of people. Of course, it depends what language you speak, right? If you speak Thai or if you speak Vietnamese or uh, Malay Indonesian or many other languages, Nga at the beginning of a word is no big deal, Maori, for example. But uh, getting the actors to say Nga was, was kind of hard. By the same token, putting an unfamiliar vowel at the end of a word was also difficult. So as you noticed a few slides back, we have the E, it distinction in Navi, just as we do in English, C, sit. But you don't have the, the lax vowel, the E, at the end of a word. So we can say me, but we don't say me. But in Navi, you do. So that's another thing that, that, um, that the actors had to kind of adapt to. OK, so what else can we say about syllable structure, which is an important part of the follow tactics? Consonant clusters. Sequences of consonants at the beginning or the end of a syllable. Uh, English, of course, goes crazy in terms of consonant clusters, right? I mean, what, in what other language do you have something like that? Three consonants of vowel and then four consonants, strengths. Okay. Uh, which is not to say that any consonant cluster in English is possible. Brick is a word. Blick is not a word, but it could be. It's a perfectly good German word, but not in English. Benick is not a word and could not be. So uh, B, R, B, L, perfectly good consonant cluster. B, N in English, no, but in other languages it's possible. Okay, so we have constraints on consonant clusters in Navi and they're quite rigid. So these are the allowable initial consonant clusters and only these. So these two fricatives and this affricate can come before any of these sounds, but that's it. So for example, um, oh, okay. So um, this kind of summarizes that whole system. So in terms of consonant clusters, the red consonant can, red consonants can be the first of a two consonant cluster. The blue consonants can be the second. But notice what you can't have. There's no possibility of KL, no possibility of TR. So it's a kind of an, kind of an interesting approach to that. So we have words like fnga, F followed by the velar nasal, akim, skom, speli, sket, snauve. Okay, so now are we finished with phonology? No, because there's still a possibility that there are pronunciation rules, that sounds will change into other sounds under certain circumstances. So take a look at this. Here are some um, very basic nouns. Nari, Kifke, Pai, Tirea, Elan, Ora. Now, here's how to say in each of these things. The word for in is me. It's actually an ad position. As we'll see a little bit later, it can come either before or after the noun. So in the I is me nari. Okay, so you say, how do you say in the world? Mehifke. Hmm. How do you say in the water? Mefai. Okay, so, okay, you immediately see that something's going on here. Um, what'd you predict for in the spirit? Okay, well, it's me sirea. In the heart, heart is e lan with the adjective, 
it's mitelan, the adjective is gone. Uh, Ora begins with a glottal stop. How do you say in the lake? Meora. The process is called lenition. Okay. Uh, it's a process that's found in a number of human languages. What I extended it to is to include the adjectives. I've never seen a language that actually includes the adjectives in this process, but it's possible that, that, that they might be. To summarize this a little bit, um, it's these eight of the 12 consonants that participate in lenition, and it's kind of a weakening. Under certain, cer certain morphological and syntactic circumstances, these sounds will weaken like this. So the adjective will come a regular stop. The regular stop will become, sorry, will become a fricative and so on. So if you're going to learn to speak, not that you have to incorporate this rule, you have to kind of make it your own. However, it's natural enough so that people have not been having a hard time doing it. If uh, uh became k, or if um, k became s, that would be wacky. But since this is all fairly natural in terms of what we expect from, from human languages and also from Navi, it seems to it seems to work pretty good. Okay, so. Those are some aspects of uh, not the phonology. Let's move on to morphology. What do the verbs look like, for example? Okay, so uh, not the verbs are not inflected for person or number. There's no person agreement, there's no number agreement, but there's plenty of stuff uh, relating to tense aspect and what we call attitudinals. So, here are some verb forms. The root is taron. Taron means hunt. It's one morpheme you can't break it down. Okay, here are some inflected forms of taron. And you can see it's a little bit strange because there are no prefixes, there are no suffixes. Everything here is done via infixation. Okay, so. Um, this makes it pretty clear. Okay, so the original root is here, and you notice how the root has been sort of cut in half, and things have been inserted in the middle. Okay, infixes are not unknown at all in human languages. Uh, Navi takes it to quite an extent, I think, probably more than, as far as I know, than any other. Um, human language does in terms of verbal infixation. So um, taron means hunt. Tolaron means that's the um, perfective aspect. It means hunting has been done, has hunted, hunted. Tayaron will hunt. Diavaron uh, may be about to hunt. This is a future subjunctive infix. Tirmareon means um, has just been hunting and I'm happy about it. The A is an attitudinal, indicating that the speaker is happy, uh, and so on. So um, that's pretty much how the verbs work in terms of infixation. At one point early on, uh, several fans wanted to see how far they could go with inserting as many infixes as possible into a verbal loop. So they came up with this sentence here. O tepikia verkeo Nenak, which means I'm so jazzed that he may be about to drink himself to death. So you wonder, how does this come about? Well, uh, let me go back a minute. Oh, whoops. I can actually use a pointer here, I think. One minute. There we go. Okay, so po means he. Uh, Nenak is an adverb. Nak is a verb meaning to drink. Uh, nina means by drinking or um, drinking li, if you like. But everything else is contained in in this verb. The root is terko, which means to die. And here's where the root is. Everything else is an infix. 
app is a reflexive inflix, in, inflix, infix, sorry. Uh, ache is causative, yiv is a future subjunctive, and a is an attitudinal, meaning I'm happy about what I'm saying. So that's a, uh, that's a sense of how verbal morphology works. Um, it's kind of an open question. Could a child learning this language, acquiring it in a natural way, hear this and say, in effect, okay, that this is a form, tepike averke is a form of the verb terko. Uh, as I say, it's kind of an open question. I, I, I think the answer is probably yes, but it remains to be seen. Okay, let's move on to nouns, to substantives. So Navi inflects its nouns. So here's a declension. Uh, we'll talk about what each of these means in just a little bit. It has a case system. Case system is called tripartite, which is a little bit unusual. Uh, Etukan is a name, it's a proper name. Uh, it's a name of, if you remember the movie, it's a name of the, um, the patriarch, uh, Neytiri's father. Okay, and here are the various suffixes that can attach to etukan. Etukan, etukanil, etukani, etukana, etukanur, etukaniri. Okay, we'll be talking about exactly what these uh, indicate in just a moment. But as you know, with an inflected language like this, you don't necessarily have to rely on, in fact, you don't have to rely on word order to get across grammatical functionality. So take this English sentence, a to concise natiri. Logically, how many ways can you permute these three elements? Well, three elements, three factorial permutations, right? Six permutations. And so here are all the permutations of a to concise natiri. So first one, primo, etukan neitiri sees, that is not English. Neitiri sees etukan is possible, but it has a different meaning. And the other three are not English. If you contrast that with navi, etukan tsea neitiri, all six possibilities are possible, may all mean the same thing. Of course, that's a consequence of the fact that subjects and objects are marked on the noun. So let's go a little deeper into the case marking system, in particular, markings on subjects and objects, because this, I think, gets kind of interesting. And um, I'd be interested if you uh, have encountered this so far in your linguistics classes. So take a look at two very different kinds of sentences. John is sleeping is obviously intransitive. John is a subject of an intransitive verb. There's no object. Mary ate the ice cream. This is transitive. Mary is doing something to something. Okay. Uh, this terminology comes from my dissertation advisor, Bernard Comrie, uh, with whom I had the great privilege of, of working when I was doing my dissertation. He's one of the most eminent linguistic typologists working today. S stands for subject, A stands for agent, and P stands for patient. Okay. Now, how do languages treat these three elements? How do these three elements align, some people would say? Well, let's take a look. What are the logical possibilities? Okay. This list gives you all the, the, the possibilities that language could do. So one thing a language could do is simply treat all of them the same or not, or equivalently not mark them at all. The way anyone know a language like that? Yeah, English. Okay. We don't mark subjects and objects for case, although we do uh, with pronouns. Okay. Line number two is a very familiar situation where Subjects of intransitive verbs, subjects of transitive verbs are marked the same, but objects are marked differently. Okay, so this is a familiar nominative accusative language. Lots of languages like that, uh, Latin, Greek, Russian, and so on. The third line is very possible in human languages, but probably a lot less familiar. 
Um, this is a language where intransitive subjects and patients are marked the same way, but agents are singled out for special language. Okay. Uh, languages like that are called ergative languages or ergative absolutive languages. Uh, and they exist, but they're a lot less familiar to speakers of Western languages. Basque is an ergative language. Georgian is an ergative language. Hindi, to a certain extent, uh, is, is an ergative language. The fourth possibility, to my knowledge, is not attested. I don't believe there are any languages uh, that single out intransitive subjects for special marking and mark agents and patients the same way. Okay. The fifth possibility is called the tripartite case system. And that's where intransitive subjects, agents, and patients are all marked differently. Now, this appears in human languages, but it's very rare. Uh, some languages that have this case marking alignment are Wankumara, which is an Australian language, um, Nez Perce or Nez Perce, the um, North American language, and Navi. So I chose. I chose something that is perfectly possible, but quite rare and unusual in human language for this alien language. Okay, so here's the case system once again, and I've signaled out the cases. This is subject, intransitive subject. This is the agentive case, the patientive case, or the object. There's a genitive, there's a dative, and not everyone will call this a case, but this is a topical. It's a topical marker. Topical markers in Navi are very useful and they sometimes obviate the need for a preposition or a postposition. So to thank someone for something, the for something is in the topical. So it's essentially you're saying, as for this gift topic, I thank you. It's like saying, I thank you for this gift. Okay. Syntax, word order flexibility. Um, before I get into this, let me, let me just say something because I know a number of you were interested in what is Navi based on? What languages, if any, served as models? Well, the answer is there is no language that Navi is based on per se. However, there are little corners of the language that reflect things that do occur in other human languages. I think that's kind of inevitable. Language constructors um, have all presumably had experience with certain human languages and it seems to me hard to avoid why certain of that wouldn't creep into the language you're constructing, especially if the language is such a human-like language. And so that's certainly true in Navi. So for example, um, Navi does not have a verb to have. To say, I have a pen, you say, there is to me a pen. Well, a language that does something very similar is Hebrew. It's a, a language that I had some experience with. And so that little part of it, I sort of took and adapted. That little part of Hebrew, I took and adapted to Navi. Um, there are certain sentence final particles in Navi, which are similar to things in Chinese. There's certain verbalizers, which are similar to things in Persian. So these things occur throughout the language. There's also plenty of stuff in the language, which as far as I know, are not found in other languages. Uh, to say, I am here, believe it or not, to use a transitive structure. You say, I occupy this place. It's as if your being here somehow affects and changes the nature of the place that you're in. So if you're in a forest, somehow the forest is different. It's changed. You've done something to the forest by being there. I thought it'd be kind of interesting to have, um, to have that as a transitive structure. Anyway, uh, okay. one of the hallmarks of Navi syntax is word order flexibility. So uh, you've already seen this with the SOV thing. Okay, there is no really preferred word order. You can have all six words, SOV, VSO, and so on, and it's still grammatical in that way. Uh, this extends to modifiers and heads. 
So to say your father, you can put that, you can put the your, either before father, father is simple, or simple, either one is fine. Adjectives, adjectives can come either before or after the noun. Uh, meep is adjective meaning you. Liu is word. Mipa liu, new word. Liu ami. And notice there's a connecting morpheme which attaches to the adjective and always comes between the noun and the adjective. Relative clauses can be either before or after the heads of the sound that I hear. Nami doesn't have prepositions or postpositions, it has add positions which can come either before or after the noun. So about Navi could be Teri Navi or Navi Teri. When it's after the noun, it's criticized on, onto that. Okay. Uh, now, how do you come up with the words? How does how is a lexicon created? Well, there are eventually there are essentially four different ways of coming up with new words. The least common word is to borrow something from one language and insert it into the other after you filter it through the Navi sound system. Uh, languages do this all the time. So for example, the word for book is book. Why is this a borrowed term? Because the Navi language is a non-written language. They didn't write it down. They didn't have the concept of book until the sky people arrived. So therefore there would be no native word for book. They, they saw a book and so they took the word book and adapted it into the Navi language. Same is true for gunship, kunship. Same is true for earth, which is rta. Another way to form words is through de derivational process. Derivational morphemes, very familiar. So again, the verb taron, which we've already seen, means hunt. Titaron is a noun with that prefix, meaning hunt, hunting as an abstract concept. A particular hunt and instantiation of hunt is setaron. Taron you is a hunter. That's all you know, very, very stamped and familiar stuff. Now, a more fun process is to actually take existing elements and combine them. So for example, uh, to be interesting is el ensi. Literally, this means to awaken the brain. So tit en is a noun meaning awakening. C is the verbalizer. El tu by itself without the R is brain. So it's to do awake, awakening to the brain. And that's to be interesting. El uh, tu left ngap, metal brain is a computer. Uh, this one is a little more complex, nifketo ngai, meaning actually in point of fact. This comes from three elements. Nifketo is situation. Ngai is true. And ni is an adverbial marker. So actually is true situationally. So that's a word that you come up with. Um, I, I just added this next slide um, yesterday because I just came up with this word for a blog post yesterday. We need a word for appreciate, late slam. What I did was I took the verb lay, meaning to have value. Slam is to understand. When you appreciate something, you understand its value. And so, late slam. Um, lang. This is a word that pertains particularly to the experience on Pandora. It's the exhilaration of first bonding with your ikran, with your banshee. If you've seen the movie, you know, you make this sahelu, this, this neural bond with your mount, and it's an exhilarating feeling. And so, this comes from the verb on, which means last word bloom and the word laun which means great joy so this feeling of own laun exhilaration of first bonding is really great joy blossoming within you okay. well the obvious the obvious fourth method of coming up with new words is simply to come up with new words just com combine or just find new roots so for example lord is beautiful evang is child to op, cloud, vertep, 
demon. How do you do this? Okay, that's where the, if there's any art involved in this, that's where it comes from. I just love rolling around sounds in my mouth and trying things out and saying, oh, this would be a nice way to say such and such. I think probably all language constructors do similar things. Uh, this, the second set illustrates something that Navi does maybe um, to a greater extent than most natural languages, which is to use a certain amount of iconicity. I don't know if you'll come across that term. Uh, something that's iconic in this sense is where the, the actual form of the word reflects something about its meaning. So, and it, 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 it's, it's, not, uh, it's not cut and dry, but it's sort of a feeling thing. So for easy and difficult, uh, easy is fdue, which is kind of a nice smooth thing. Difficult is ngazi, okay? Smooth, smooth is fao. Rough is ektu. You get the idea. Okay, uh, now. This, in, in a sense, as I mentioned, is kind of the fun part. How does a language reflect the culture, the environment, the, the, um, the people who speak it? Well, one interesting thing is that I realized early on that the Navi have four digits on their hands and not five. So I said to Jim Cameron, you know, I bet they don't have a decimal numbering system, I bet the numbering system is octal. And he said, absolutely. So this is, it's a base eight counting system. And the way you count is Ao, Mune, E, Sing, Mr, Pukap, Kine, Vo, that's eight. Nine is eight and one, Vo Lao, 10 is eight and two, Vo Moon and so on. Okay. Other things? Um, Ceremonies are important in the culture. There's sort of a ceremonial register of the language. So the normal word for I is oe, but in ceremonial use, it's ohe. Normal nga meaning you, ceremonially, honorifically is nga nga, lu to be, and, and, you, and so on. Uh, This is kind of fun because languages develop their own proverbs and sayings. And it was a lot of fun to, to come up with, with things that would be really appropriate to the environment, to the culture, to the experience and reflect who the Navi are. So for example, um, this is not mine. This, is, this was something that came from someone in the Navi community. The tail and the ears also speak which is to say, don't just listen to the words, look at the body language. I'll give you a few more examples. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. This is one of the amazingly interesting plants on Pandora. In English, it's called the Helicoradian and the Nami word is Loreu. It's these spiral things which are extremely sensitive. As soon as you touch them, they zoom back into the ground. You, and you remember that from the movie? So um, we have a proverb, or a similar <coughs> metaphor rather, naloreo anampi, which means like a touch helicoreti. You use that for someone who's especially shy. Kind of like that. Um, proverbs often include word play. This is kind of fun. So if you look at something in English, like all that glitters is not gold, okay. Why is it glitters? Why isn't it all that shines is not gold? That'd be just as good, right? Well, no, it wouldn't be just as good because there's this nice alliteration with the two Gs in English. It kind of sounds nice. A stitch in time saves nine. Why not a stitch in time saves 11? Why not saves 10? Well, because of the similarity in sound between time and nine. Happens in other languages too. Uh, when I was studying Persian, I loved this uh, this particular proverb. It's har gerdi gerdunist, which means all that's round is not a walnut. Literally, this is all roundness, walnut, 
not is. Okay. Why in the world would anyone say that? Well, obviously, there is this, this beautiful similarity between Gerdi and Gerdu. Uh, in Yiddish, uh, when you need brains, brawn doesn't help. So here you have a, a boxer who is looking at a calculus textbook. So the word for brains is mayach, the word for strength is koyach, and you see the similarity. Well, the same thing can happen in Navi. Um, I came up with some that I think are really kind of, kind of nice. Kemamuia kumafe. Good action, bad result. Use this when you know you have the best intentions in the world, but it just didn't turn out very well. Kem means action, kum is result. Kind of sounds nice. Fweke um, kafwefu. A mantis doesn't whistle. Fweke is mantis. Fwefu is whistle. And you can see why this kind of sounds nice. Nice wordplay. And not be, you would use it to say that don't expect someone to do something that's not in their nature. Uh, this was a, there's a recent one. Pailalip, sketirip, dripping water pierces a rock. Leap is to drip, reap is to pierce. Okay. Uh, this word uh, I came up with almost as a stunt to see how far I could go with uh, sequencing vowels. Meo auni aea. It's eight syllables and it has only two consonants. I came up with the word before I figured out what it should mean, but I figured it'd be, a, it'd be nice to, for it to represent the concept of living harmoniously with nature. Okay, so those are some things about language, culture, and environment. Okay, um, working with the actors, we'll go through this kind of quickly. So this is what the set looked like, uh, does not look like a typical movie set at all, as you can see. I got to meet some people that I never thought I would, I would meet before. By the way, I just realized I should turn up the brightness of my screen. Is that better? No. Anyway, sorry if I didn't do it before. Um, this is what I presented to the actors very, very typically. So in addition to making recordings of this for them, uh, I gave them this, this text. So this is the actual Navi in Navi spelling. The underscores indicate stress. Stress in Navi is not predictable and it's sometimes distinct. You just have to know where the stress goes. So they had to learn that. I gave them a word by word gloss. And then something that they found useful was sort of this sort of pseudo phonetic transcription, kind of an Englishy phonetic transcription. I tried to wean people off relying on this too much, but still a lot, a lot of people found it, found it helpful. Okay, uh, this is what actors look like on the set. They're wearing these performance capture suits. Uh, and that's what you see when you're looking at, at the action, what's happening. But of course, the incredible computer uh, technology turns that into this and this and this and this. Okay, what has happened since in Mudroya? I see, I'm, I'm, as usual, I'm running a little late. Uh, it's been almost an hour. Um, I think we'll probably finish up in about uh, five, six minutes. That'll be okay. Okay. So, what's happened after the movie? Well, there have been a number of official ventures. One is the Cirque du Soleil uh, production which was called Toto, the first flight, based on an avatar theme uh, done with the blessing of James Cameron and John Landau. And it incorporated actually quite a bit of the language. So that was a lot of fun. Um, quite an amazing experience. The other thing is that there is now a theme park, as you may know, Pandora, the world of avatar in Orlando, which is actually <laughs> very well done. There's a ride there uh, called Flight of Passage which takes five minutes, but if you need to stand in line for three hours for it, I would say do it because it's really memorable and unforgettable. Um, just some scenes from, from the park. 
this is um, one of the things they hand out to people entering the park. Uh, right down here, there are the safety rules for how to conduct yourself in the park so that you're, you emerge unscathed. And as you see, they're in English and in Nazi. So I thought that was kind of a nice touch. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk about is the Litfiaolo, which is a language community. And in many respects, this for me is, I wouldn't say more fulfilling than the movie, but maybe just as fulfilling. So the movie came out at the end of 2009. And a few days before, the movie came out, I received this email, which astonished me. Well, it turns out what had happened was I had already put a few things out about the language. I had uh, posted some things to a uh, forum for linguists. A glossary had leaked out, a preliminary glossary with about, I don't know, a few hundred items. And people had gotten together and essentially did their very best to deconstruct the language. And they did an amazing job. Uh, this is, as I say, very early. It's not perfect, but it's darn good. And I was very surprised. And so that began my association with the language community, with this group of people in a number of different countries who have embraced the language to the extent that they're using it for genuine communication. Uh, there's actually been a study of the Navi community by a, a, a real uh, anthropologist, linguistic anthropologist, Christine Schreier, up at the University of British Columbia, who actually studied the Navi fans to see what kind of what kind of people they were, why they might be involved with, you know, why devote so much time and effort to this kind of thing. Um, so this was a meeting we had the very first get together, which was in October of 2010. It was a teach the teachers meeting. Um, some of these people are still very much involved with the language. Britain has become a very close friend. Uh, I was just speaking with Corey the other day. William has done an amazing work and so on. Just some, uh, some of the hijinks. I taught a class, uh, which was an awful lot of fun. Up until recently, there was an avatar meetup every year. In fact, two avatar meetups, one in North America and one in Europe. So this was from the one in Europe in 2013, which I attended. Uh, this was the Berlin um, main train station, as you can see. And um, these people actually walked through the streets of Berlin to meet me and <laughs> create a crowd of stir, I must say. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, um, during the meetups, I always um, had a chance to teach a class, which I really enjoyed. Of course, the question is an hour a year, you may not learn very much, but uh, for people who wanted to go on, there were other ways of, of getting into language as well. There's some of the students in the classroom, interaction. Uh, this is one of the handouts that I had. So this is a very, very early hand. This is very traditional stuff, okay, dialogues, a few little paradigms um, had in practice and so on. Here are some of the things that people in the community have, have, have put together. Uh, this was an early review of the movie Inception entirely in Natvi. This was an answer to Hello Kitty in Natvi. Um, people came up with a way of reciting the alphabet in Natvi and so on. Uh, this by the way is, um, is a, is a screen capture of my blog, which is still continuing. It's called Navi Teddy about Navi. That's where I introduce new vocabulary, have discussions about grammar and so on. Uh, this is a lapel pin, pin um, designed by uh, my husband, John, as a contribution to the Navi community. I think it's quite beautiful. It says, Ivong Navi, which is something that someone in the community came up with. It means let Navi bloom, let Navi blossom. I really like it. Uh, this is just something from my blog from the end of last year, shows you how I introduce new vocabulary with examples and so on. We've also had writing contests. So this was from a haiku contest. This was the winning 
entering in the haiku concept, which I really like. It's a typical 575 haiku. Um, Britain did it. Sureo ma frapo sureo, aoa eoio, ozasi viko. It's a translation. What I love about it is that the longest line with seven syllables looks to be the shortest. It's really very clever, I think. Um, oh, I want you to hear this. This is the beginning of a short story by Stefan Müller, who is one of the really incredible experts in the Navi language. And it's a story about Istau, who was a young Navi, and a, um, I'm sorry, I'm interacting with a cat here, and a Syaxio, which is, um, maybe it's called a prolemerous, sort of um, a somewhat simian-like animal on Pandora. I just want to play you the beginning of the story and listen to how beautifully he reads, not me. Come on. I'm not a favorite at the island during his tower, Sisukoe. Ne we be venga in artery, they at the island. They pelun. Taluna fit the island do puma me come to tan, Sisyaxu. Sreker, Kerulen fit if Kato Kauker. Fit the Elaneri Pefialen, Septimitium. Tono, Kratutana Elwana Luistau Tarminari Alparut Anuk Eye, Sixto Lampol Haumpantias Ton Aminari. Yeah, uh, he, 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 he really is one of the most beautiful Navi speakers we have. Okay, uh, we have two official dictionaries put together entirely by people in the community. No compensation purely as a language, as a labor of love. Um, There's a page from the kind of standard dictionary. You'll see it has lexical items uh, with IPA uh, and the typical things you, you'd expect, something about the derivations as well. But I want you to take a look at this. This is an annotated dictionary put together by Stefan, and it's quite extraordinary. Not only does it give every lexical item we've had, but it also gives examples, example sentences, things that I've come up with over the years. It's been 11 years now. Uh, and all sorts of hot links and cross references. It's really a work of art. To me, it looks like something published by the uh, university, you know, by the Oxford University Press. Really quite, quite impressive. Okay, uh, the last thing I'll leave you with, if you're interested in constructed languages in general, beyond not being, I hope you are, um, there's now a documentary film. It's called Con Langing. Um, full disclosure, I had um, a role in it. It was put together by Britton Watkins, and it tells a story of constructed languages, but not just the quote unquote famous ones, not just the Hollywood languages uh, like Klingon and like Dothraki and like Navi, but the fact that there are a lot of people out there who are constructing languages purely for the love of it, purely for their own use. And it profiles a lot of these people. If you're interested, you can go to conlangenfilm.com. Anyway, Irayo, thank you very much. Uh, ran a little long, sorry, but um, I'll uh, be happy to take some questions. Uh, I got to stop. Thank you. Th thank you so much. Um, yeah, if, if everybody could put their questions in the uh, participants tab by raising your hand. Um, we have a question from Maya. Okay, uh, uh, give me just one second. I want to kind of get rid of this if I okay. can. Okay. Uh, are we cool now? We're, we're, we're just normally zooming now, right? Okay. Yep. Okay, cool. Hi, Maya. Hi, that was really great, by the way. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So you talked about how some of the grammar and syntax was motivated by other languages uh, that, that you know or you've studied. But I was wondering if the phonology came from anything or if that was inspired by anything or if you kind of just like pick and chose somewhat randomly. Yeah, but well, I mean, one thing that um, that I tried to do, as I said, was try to incorporate the words that Cameron had come up with himself. So, uh, for example, he had come up with words like palulukan, 
Okay, so I knew that you know those sounds had to be in the language. Uh, and also I excluded certain sounds, as I said, like the voice stops, because those would not be characteristic of the kind of Polynesian language, Polynesian sound that I think he had in his mind. Um, aside from that, it was just my, my, my sort of, I, I will not say random choice, but a choice that I, th that I thought worked pretty well. It's just as important to consider the sounds that you're not gonna include as the sounds you're gonna include. I sometimes liken it to, to cooking. You know, you have a whole shelf of spices, but if you throw everything in that you have, it's gonna be a, kind of a mess. It's not gonna have any mm -hmm. character. But if you pick and choose judiciously, then you can come up with something that kind of has some character. That's okay, much. thank you. Sure. Um, Alyssa? Hey, thank you for uh, your presentation. It was really great. Um, so you said near the beginning that um, you had to, you were given like a set of around 30, 30 words that uh, Jason, that was like already came up with. Um, I'm wondering, you said that you had to stay consistent with those, right? But I'm wondering if they themselves stayed consistent within those 30 words or were they just kind of like a hodgepodge of anything? Okay, well, what I did was throw out the words that were not consistent. So mo most of them actually were very consistent with the sound system that I had in mind. There was one word that had B and Navi does not have voice stop. So I, I, I simply threw out that word. And um, Jim, Jim Cameron didn't seem to mind. So I, 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 I was kind of happy about that. But, but, but yeah, so I mean, the, the sound system that I came up with includes his original words, but it goes quite a bit further than that. But, but it, at least it did, it did incorporate that. But, you know, as I say, there wasn't a lot. And so I, re I really didn't have an off, it wasn't a huge constraint, let's put it that way. Uh, Jacob. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm actually right now going working on one of my conlangs. I'm trying to oh. figure out how to deal with co uh, copula. I don't actually know how you pronounce the word, but so how does Navi uh, handle the copula? Okay, so Navi does have a copula. The copula is lu, and uh, it's inflected the way any other verb is inflected. So it's it doesn't have um, it, it it it's it there, there is no agreement between the copula and number or uh, gender or person. But uh, it can appear pretty much anywhere in the sentence. And um, it's simply equivalent to English B. So that, 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 that's pretty much what it was. And um, you can't, it, it, in certain set phrases, you can leave it out, but uh, normally you do have to put it in. So are, are, you, are, you, are you thinking of having an explicit copula or? Yeah, I was thinking about having something where it was like zero copula for, uh, for adjectives, but then uh, having an explicit copula for linking nouns. Zero like, mm -hmm. It's so like no, not using it when you're linking a noun and an adjective. So basically like, the, like you could just say tall, uh, tall dog to mean the dog is tall or tall dog. And then for like nouns, you'd have to actually have the copula. Okay, but to say tall dog is barking, how would you say that? I mean, you would just say tall dog is barking. So like, like it, 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 you, yeah, basically tall dog is barking could either mean the tall dog is barking or it can mean the dog that is tall is barking. So like adjectives would yeah. both act as like verbs and relative clauses and all, like all the like kind of thing. Yeah, um, that sounds like, like, like it would, Probably work. Yeah. Good. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, Jordan. Hi, I, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I had a I had a question about. Hi, Jordan. Uh, well, I guess one of the th one of the things that seems uh, really interesting to me about like constructing languages is that you can basically create things in whatever order you want. And I was like, which obviously is not true of like, like you can develop aspects of the language in whatever order you want, which isn't true of you know, the way natural languages develop. So I was wondering, like, for example, you have all these very beautiful, nicely flowing proverbs. Did you develop vocabulary to like get the <laughs> proverbs to work or did you come up with the vocabulary and then figure out the proverbs in the contents? That's a very good question. 
<laughs> Very good question. I have to, now, I would say that in 90 to 95% of, of the time when I was coming up with proverbs, I use what we already had. And so I didn't try to kind of, uh, I wouldn't say cheat, but sort of finesse the situation. With that very last proverb, um, we had the, the, the verbs leap and reap, I have to confess that I kind of thought of it. They would be a nice proverb to have. We don't yet have a verb for pierce. So what would be a verb for pierce that would kind of make the proverb cute? And so, but uh, I, I didn't do that too often. I have, I'm happy to say. Makes sense. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, nobody has their hand up right now, so I'll jump in with a question of my own. Um, I, I thought the affix, uh, the infix system was was really interesting. I've never seen a language with such heavy infixes. Right. I was just I was wondering how you uh, decided on on that, and um, what are the rules governing where you put your infixes, and how did you decide those? Okay. Well, to answer the second part first, there are very strict rules as to where you put your infixes in, in, in and where you put your infixes. Um, there are first position infixes. There are second position infixes. Um, and when I introduce a new verb, I have to specify where the infixes go. And so that's actually part of the dictionary entry of where it goes. So um, for example, a verb like taron, which has two syllables, um, there are actually two possible slots for where infixes go. And it could be that all infixes go in the first slot or all infixes go in the second slot or certain infix infixes go in the first slot and certain in the second. So that's all very highly specified. Um, as to how I came up with that in general, it just seemed like something interesting to do. You know, again, a, 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 along the lines of trying to make Navi a learnable language in a sense, a very human-like language, but also pushing the boundaries a bit and realizing that it's spoken on another planet and it might have some unusual aspects. And so I tried to take something that was less common in most human languages and expand it, uh, hopefully not beyond the breaking point, but to the point where it was kind of um, alien, a little bit unusual, yeah. Thank you, yeah, that, that, was, that was really interesting. Well, well, let me say one, one more important thing about the kinds of choices you make. Um, we were talking a little bit about the idea that language reflects to a certain extent, culture and environment and even physiology sometimes. You have to be careful not to push that too far. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the superior war hypothesis, um, which has had various incarnations, which has to do with the relationship between language and thought, language and perception, the way you perceive the world. Um, the kinds of grammatical choices in syntax, in morphology, for example, where the verb goes, does the verb go in the beginning or the middle or the end, or is it very flexible? That has absolutely nothing to do with the nature of the speakers. That is really arbitrary. And, and so though, and, and so, you know, I, I mean, logically, you might ask yourself, do people who speak a verb initial language have a slightly different view of the world than people who speak a verb final language? You know, the question itself is not is is, is not wrong, it's not inconceivable, but the answer is there is no impact whatsoever. Uh, because people have tried to, to find an impact. Um, one interesting thing that I, that I came across recently, um, by the way, I, 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 I wrote along two books, which you might, if you haven't seen it, you might find interesting. Um, this one is Through the Looking Glass by the linguist Guy Deutscher, Why the World Looks Different in other languages. This one, The Language Hoax by well-known uh, linguist John McWhorter. Why the world looks the same in any language. And this is obviously a reply to the other book. 
and the issue is do the do, there's a structure of your language the nitty-gritty of your language does that impinge in any way on the way you actually see the world of course initially the you know benjamin wharf said yeah it does and people who speak different native languages never really have the same picture of the world because their language is a, almost like a straitjacket that forces you to see the world in a certain way. Well, no one believes that today, but there are new versions of the superior wharf hypothesis, which people are entertaining and, and find very interesting. Uh, if your language has grammatical gender, you know, for things that are not gendered, does that have anything to do with the way you, you see the world? Uh, in okay, the world of ocean, okay? In Spanish, it's masculine, el mar. In French, it's feminine, la mer. In German, it's neuter, das Meer. So if you speak those languages, do you perceive the ocean in the same way? Is there any difference in the way you might perceive the ocean because of that? Those are interesting questions and they're not, and the answers are not straightforward. And, and, and you actually kind of have to do some experimentation. But anyway, I, getting back to my main point, uh, lots of the choices that you make in your constructed language, even though it's meant for a very specific group of speakers, very specific environment, those choices really are arbitrary. Thank you. Uh, I believe Joanna has a question that was uh, sent to her. Hi. Um, so the question was, uh, did you notice or incorporate any uh, dialectical changes from uh, speakers that have been learning the language um, over the 11 years. And then I'd like to like tack onto that. When you were creating language, did you have, when like, did you have language change that you were doing? Um, so like, did you, did you create like the history of the language as you were making it? Um, okay, so the, the first part of your question was about dialectical differences, Joanna, about, you, did, did you mean dialectical differences among the Navi on Pandora or among the people in the language community? I think the second one. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the biggest differences I heard really were in pronunciation. Uh, the, 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 I, I didn't, I, I, I can't think of any times that I would see, say, a piece of writing or, or hear people speaking and, and say that the syntax was somehow influenced by their native language. But definitely you could tell when, very often you could tell when a German speaker was speaking, not me or when a, a French speaker, that kind of thing, which is kind of inevitable, I suppose. Um, I'm sorry, the other part of your question was what? Uh, when you were creating the language, did you have, uh, did you like create like a proto language or anything right, 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 right. like that? Okay, so um, I didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time constructing various stages along the way, but you, if you want to do a good job, you have to, you do have to think in, in those terms. So if I came up with say a new compound and I put three elements together, I kind of had to think, what would happen to this combination over the centuries? How might it evolve? How, wh what kinds of assimilations might have taken place? What, what sort of, what, what, would vowels have dropped anywhere, that kind of thing. So in that sense, you have to think of sort of the evolution of a term so that the term might have uh, had a specific form centuries ago, but then over the course of, uh, of time, it, it evolved to a place where it is today. And I often explain that when I'm introducing new vocabulary. I will sometimes say, okay, here's what the original term was. Again, I'm not very specific about, you know, exactly what point in the history of not really took place, but here's the original term. And then you have your sort of evolution arrow. Okay, then there was an intermediate stage here. And now it's an art that has here. So yeah, you um, if 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 you want to think of those terms, you have to do a good job 
of, of, of sort of thinking uh, chronologically, if you like, as opposed to uh, simply synchronically. Also, if ever you're doing a conlang and there might be different dialects that you're dealing with, then you kind of have to think, okay, where did this dialect come from? Where did this dialect come from? Uh, do they come from the same parent language? And then you evolved into two slightly different daughters, you know, th those kinds of things. What kinds of historical changes took place? Yeah. We have Jacob back with another question. Okay. Hi, yeah, it's actually related to what you just talked about. And so also inspired by Joanna's question. So uh, and that's just, what, what are the kind of dialectical variations of not be? Or did you make any? Um, I can't say too much about that. Okay. I'm guessing it's related but, to the next piece. Well, um, there are going to be, you know, I, I, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying yes or no, but there are going to be sequels. And in fact, there are four sequels in the works. Um, the first of which is going to come out in 2022. And it, it's been you know, a continuing pleasure for me to work on the language and to work on the language that's going to be in the sequels. The, um, the movies um, are in-house numbered A1 through A5. So A1 is the original movie. And there's A2 through A5. Those scripts are all written, by the way. Uh, and A2 and A3 are very much in production. A2, according to James Cameron, is pretty much finished. And A3 is getting there as well. So the, uh, the schedule, the debuts have been, have been changed. Uh, at this point, first one is coming out in 2022, the end of 2022. And then they'll be staggered in uh, two year spaces. So I hope I'll be around for A5, for A5 but <laughs> fingers crossed. Uh, we have a question from Paul. Hi, Paul. Hey, sorry. Um, I was wondering, um, were you involved in any songwriting in Navi? And uh, how does the language in that sense influence the composition and the songwriting? Yeah. Yes, I was very much involved in songwriting, which was a very interesting experience. I imagine, um, yeah. yeah. Um, and so um, working with the composer, typically, well, you, you know, when, 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 when there's a team, uh, a musician and a lyricist, the question is which comes first? Does the music come first or do the lyrics come first? In the case of Navi, um, pretty much we had a sense of what James Cameron wanted the song to say. And so I would typically come up with the lyrics, hopefully make them somewhat poetical if I could. And then I would get together with the uh, composer um, and we would work on it together and he would often get back to me and saying, look, this line is really good, but it's just the, the, the next line is just not gonna work. And uh, I really need a vowel for this note. You know, please, please don't give me a, a, at the end of the end of this. And so there would be a fair amount of back and forth and a fair amount of compromise. Um, one thing that made it easier than it might be is the very flat, very fact of the word order flexibility of the language. And I kind of thought that would be the case, but actually it turned out to be the case. So if I gave the composer a line and he just wasn't happy with it and he had certain music in mind and said, you know, can we change this stuff around? Um, I could often rearrange things so that I really wasn't changing the sense, changing the meaning at all, but it was still viable linguistically, but it also fit the music much better. And so that was kind of, that was part of the interaction we had, which was a, a very nice experience. Um, yeah, so that it, 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 it's, it's a collaboration, but it was a, a lot of fun. Thanks. Sure. 
All right, I, I don't see any more questions and we have hit the hour and a half mark. Um, so thank you so much for your time. That was my pleasure. a really fascinating uh, talk. We really appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure, it was great to talk to you guys. And um, just in case anybody has any questions that occur to you afterwards, or uh, you know, you're wondering about your own con lines, um, drop me an email. Okay, I'd be happy to talk to you. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you.